On behalf of the LEAD Center, I'd like to welcome everyone. We're so glad that you have joined us today to learn about a roadmap to inclusive career pathways, promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA, through cross-system partnerships. Today's webinar is hosted by the Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities, also known as LEAD Center. We are a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Policy Development Center. The LEAD Center is led by National Disability Institute and Social Policy Research Associates and is funded by the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. And together, we facilitate the adoption and integration of inclusive WILA programs, policies, and practices through research, technical assistance, and demonstration projects. My name is Laura Glenick, and I serve as the co-director of the LEAD Center and represent National Disability Institute, and will be serving as your moderator today. I go by the pronouns she and her, I am a white woman with medium long brown hair and wear glasses, and today I'm wearing a navy blue shirt. Next slide. To ensure everyone can participate fully in today's webinar, we'd like to take a moment to share some captioning and housekeeping tips. Today's webinar is live captioned, and the captions appear below the slide deck. You also have the option to open the captioning webpage in a new browser, and the links have been posted in the chat or will be momentarily. Once the captioning window opens on your own system, you can adjust the background color, the text color, and the fonts using the drop-down menus at the top of the browser window. Next slide. We really do encourage you to ask any questions that you might have about the content we cover today. At any point, you can click the Q&A button that's located on the webinar's menu bar, and this will bring up a Q&A panel or a window in which you can type questions for our presenters. We'll save time at the end for a question and answer period. Please use the chat box if you're experiencing any technical issues or have questions for the technical support team. Next slide. To kick off our presentation today, we would like to welcome Anupa Jiwagis, who is the Chief of Staff at the Office of Disability Employment Policy, also known as ODEP, at the, universe, at the U.S. Department of Labor. As Chief of Staff for the Office of Disability Employment Policy, she collaborates closely with ODEP's Assistant Secretary and other U.S. Department of Labor leaders to identify and implement strategies for increasing the number and quality of employment opportunities for people with disabilities. In so doing, the Chief of Staff draws on years of legal experience in both the public and nonprofit sectors. She came to the Department of Labor from the U.S. Department of Defense, where she served as a subject matter expert and senior policy advisor for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives. Prior to that work, she worked for seven years at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, Office of Federal Operations, where she was instrumental in implementing updates, strengthening Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Before joining the EEOC's Office of Federal Operations, Chief of Staff Guy Varghese was a confidential assistant to the EEOC commissioner, a position to which she played a leading role in the agency's curb cuts to the middle class initiative, an innovative federal cross-agency effort to increase employment and economic self-sufficiency for people with disabilities. And before beginning federal service, she worked for various nonprofit organizations, among them the Mental Disability Advocacy Center, and served as a union organizer for the Service Employees International Union. 
Sheetha Stah Jidargis holds a JD from Seattle University School of Law and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of California, Los Angeles. And I would now like to turn it over to the Chief of Staff to provide a welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anupa Kivargis. I am a brown woman uh, with longish black hair. I am wearing uh, red glasses and matching red lipstick. First off, I just wanna wish everybody a happy new year and welcome to LEED's first webinar of the calendar year. As Laura said, my name is Anupa Kivargis and I am the Chief of Staff for the Office of Disability Employment Policy. As many of you know, ODEP's mission is to develop and influence policies and practices that increase the number and quality of employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Given that our mission, we are really excited to report a positive trend in the employment of people with disabilities as we move towards a post-COVID workplace. Data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates the employment rates of people with disabilities in 2022 now exceeds pre-COVID-19 levels and actually even pre-Great Recession levels. And while there is great reason for optimism, it should be noted that the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is still unfortunately much higher than those without disabilities. And there still exists a significant gap in the labor force participation rate between people with and without disabilities. And there are even greater disparities among black and brown people with disabilities. So there is still considerable work for all of us to do to ensure our workplaces are disability inclusive. And one way to increase employment rates is to ensure that career pathways are diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible to people with disabilities. And that's why webinars such as today's is so important. Now, as we know, data helps us measure progress. And that's why we at ODEP are so excited to announce that in December, our research and evaluation team released an interactive map that visualizes how employment rates or employment population ratios vary by state to state and between different race and ethnic groups within working age adults with disabilities. And this map shows data from the period of 2016 to 2020. We believe that this map will help bring value to those of you who are members of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives. A couple other exciting ODEP announcements I wanted to share. Uh, one is from last week, ODEP announced the 11 states participating in our National Expansion of Employment Opportunities Network or NEON initiative. So congratulations to California, Colorado, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Kansas, Kentucky, Missouri, New York, Rhode Island, and Tennessee. These states will be working with subject matter experts to develop policy to increase competitive integrated employment for people with disabilities. And specifically, they will be working in areas such as blading, braiding, blending, braiding, and sequencing data collection and state strategic planning. Also wanted to alert folks that January 26 was National Thank You, Thank you to Your Mentor Day. And in honor of that, uh, national, in honor of National Mentoring Month, ODEP released a blog called Honoring the Impact of Mentoring Today and Every Day. We really encourage you to check that out. And finally, in a preview of our activities, in 2023, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The Rehab Act is the foundational piece of civil rights legislation all disability rights legislation is built upon. It is the touchstone for full inclusion of people with disabilities in higher education, employment, government, and the private sector. The Department of Labor is planning activities to commemorate the Rehab Act, and we will be sure to share that information with you through the LEAD Center. We are really grateful for your participation in today's webinar, and I'd especially like to thank the LEAD Center for hosting the webinar. 
and also want to thank our speakers from DC that you will be hearing from. I really look forward to hearing more about all the great work that you're doing to advance DEIA. Thank you and back to Laura. Great, thank you for that. Next slide, please. Thank you, uh, Chief of Staff, Chief Argus, for your welcoming introduction and helping to set the stage for today's wonderful discussion. And she mentioned that there's still a lot of work to be done, and we're excited that you're going to learn about some of this great work today. I'm really delighted to be serving as a moderator for today's webinar. I am joined by my colleague, Shahida Brown, who is also part of the LEAD Center and serves as National Disability Institute's Director of Equity and Inclusion. Shahida will be introducing our four guest panelists from the District of Columbia a little later in the presentation and leading them in a panel discussion. So let's get started. Next slide. Through today's presentation, you will gain a broad understanding of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act's vision for career pathways to promote workforce development and equal opportunity, explore options for strategic career pathways, partnerships, and opportunities to leverage resources across systems and improve engagement of underserved populations, discover opportunities for systems coordination to improve employment and career outcomes for underserved populations, including youth and adults with disabilities, and learn about resources to engage businesses, leverage partnerships, promote career-based learning, uh, advance DEIA, and support youth, all through an interactive online inclusive career pathways tool. Next slide. So let's start by providing some context. The Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act has a primary focus on creating career pathways for job seekers to achieve their desired employment goal and to assist them in advancing economically. Inclusive career pathways are programs and approaches designed to support people whose career options have been limited because they lack the academic and or technical skills necessary to complete the credentialing requirements of many key high growth uh, career opportunities. Creating career pathways to competitive integrated employment is one of three priorities of LEAD Center's activities. And finally, inclusive career pathways promote cross-agency leveraging of resources, which we're going to learn more about through our panel discussion. Next slide. The LEAD Center developed an interactive online tool called the Roadmap to Inclusive Career Pathways to provide workforce professionals with resources to help people with disabilities achieve employment and economic self-sufficiency. It contains curated best practices based on key focus areas and strategies that support the workforce system. And these are strategies and practices that promote inclusive workforce practices through a diversity and inclusion lens. And today I'm going to provide a cursory overview of the roadmap. So let's check it out. You will note that on the LEAD Center website, you can find the roadmap under the navigation tab, Employment Strategies. Click on it and scroll down to Roadmap to Inclusive Career Pathways. The curated best practices are broken down into five key areas, each containing subtopics. These five areas align with the applicable six key uh, career pathway elements, WILA, and disability and employment best practices, and include leverage, leveraging partnerships and collaboration. Oops, sorry about that. And where you will learn how to build effective community partnerships and collaborations that align public and private resources to improve the inclusion of people from underserved groups, including individuals with disabilities in career pathways programs, engaging businesses 
learn how to promote active engagement with the business sector to identify the skills and support that workers need to grow in a career pathway. Designing career-based learning, where you'll learn how to provide diverse job-driven training opportunities for individuals with disabilities, including work-based training approaches, such as on-the-job training, summer youth employment, registered apprenticeships, and intern internships, and other paid work experiences. Advancing compliance and inclusion, Learn about tools and resources that build capacity to increase access to services and outcomes for all people, including job skills with disabilities, people of color, and others who have been historically underserved in the public workforce system. And then finally, serving youth with disabilities. Well, you will learn about tools and resources to help increase the participation of youth with disabilities in existing career pathway systems and programs. The Inclusive Career Pathways tool includes frequently asked questions for each subtopic that fall within the five key areas. These frequently asked questions are meant to highlight a resource or two. They focus on common questions that we know that American Job Center staff may have. And they highlight a variety of different strategies, practices, target populations, and resource mediums. Uh, for example, tools, websites, briefs, resources, et cetera, that are available within the, uh, within the roadmap. Each subtopic includes a resource list of best practices. So let's see how this looks. I'm going to click on Designing Career-Based Learning. You're going to notice that it includes, starts with the introduction, tells you what you're going to learn in this section. And then you're going to find the subcategories that are part of this key area. And under the, for each subcategory, you are going to have a list of frequently asked questions and then a list of resources. So why don't we choose inclusive career pathway design strategies and see an example of the frequently asked question. How can we design our work-based learning experiences so they are inclusive to job seekers with disabilities? And then it will lead you to a resource and share how you might use it. In this case, learn how community colleges develop and provide inclusive work-based learning experiences to provide students with disabilities to join the workforce. And then you'll see resources include the same subtopic areas. And here, we're going to choose diversity and inclusion. And under each subtopic, you'll see an annotated list of the curated resources. Under this category, you'll see a resource for disability disclosure for returning citizens with disabilities. You'll find a link directly to the resource and then an annotated description of how, what it is and how you may be able to use it. Each of the five steps along the roadmap include the same layout. Um, this is just a very cursory overview. I hope that it gives you a nice glimpse and that you will all visit it later as a go-to tool as you increase uh, inclusive career pathways. So with that, uh, we're going to go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing the presentation. Thank you. And I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Shahida Brown, who's going to start by talking about intersecting ideas, identities. She'll introduce our wonderful panel today and facilitate the panel discussion. So Shahida, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura, for introducing me. Um, hi, everyone. I am Shahida Brown, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a Black woman. I am wearing a white button-down shirt with a navy blue blazer sitting in a Black chair, and I'm so delighted to be facilitating the panel portion of today's webinar. Before I engage with the panel, I wanted to share a few words regarding intersecting identities. Intersecting identities is the concept that an individual's identity 
consists of multiple intersecting factors, including but not limited to their disability, gender identity, gender expression, their race, ethnicity, social class, religious belief, sexual identity, and sexual expression. In essence, we want to acknowledge an individual as their whole self, not just single out um, parts of their identity. For Career Pathways programs to be fully inclusive, Career Pathway partners must build cultural and linguistic competence so that everyone is equipped to include people with intersecting identities. We brought together a panel of people who have been implementing strategies for many years for, um, effective, for effective outreach and engagement of people from underserved communities to engage them in employment. They represent workforce development, vocational rehabilitation, adult education, and a community partner who has a family member with a disability. And now the time has come for me to introduce our panel and I will begin by sharing their brief bios. Next slide, please. First up, I'm gonna uh, introduce is Mark Augusto, who is the supervisor of intake and outreach for the DC Department on Disability Services and the co-chair of Bridging Aging and Disability Networks and Racial Equity Community of Practice. Through this role, Mark works to ensure that DC residents have streamlined and easy access to services and supports for both the state DD and vocational rehabilitation agencies. Next, there's Ms. Allison White, who serves people with disabilities and their families in the District of Columbia as the Executive Director of the DC Developmental Disabilities Council. In this role, Allison leads grassroots efforts to build an inclusive DC community through policy advocacy and program development that promotes self-determination, integration, and social justice. Allison also serves as the co-chair of Bridging Aging and Disability Networks and Racial Equity Community of Practice. Now we have Madeline Levi Cruz, who is the Associate Dean of Workforce Development and Lifelong Learning at the University of the District of Columbia. Ms. Levi Cruz has been working in post-secondary education for over 20 years with a focus on occupational training. Her work has included being a campus president, a dean, and leading the WIOA programs uh, in Pennsylvania. Last but certainly not least, there is Azave Aturo Adure, is the founder and president of the Ethiopian Eritrean Special Needs Community. She is the community rights advocate who works with DC and Maryland Developmental Disability Council to advocate for the rights of people with developmental disabilities and their access to necessary services. So I just wanna say welcome to all of our presenters. With that, I'm gonna jump in to the first question. Next slide, please. We know DC has a long standing cross system cultural and linguistic competence, also known as CLC working group, and has integrated learning and principles from that group into systems change and daily practices. DC continues this work through the bridging aging and disability networks and racial equity community of practice. Mark and Allison, can you tell us how this trajectory has supported employment outcomes for people with disabilities? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Allison White. My pronouns are she, her. I am white. I have chin length brown hair. I've got my teal and orange earrings on today. And my office background has some colorful stickers and, and green plants behind me. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, Shahira, thanks for this question. Um, our work on cultural and linguistic competence and using that as a framework for our employment efforts 
began in earnest in, in 2013 with the Supporting Families Community of Practice and the launch of person-centered thinking training across all levels of the service system for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We, we started asking who is here and who are we missing so that we could identify communities that we weren't reaching. So with that, we established some practices that could help us reach more people, including offering stipends for community members who contributed to systems change work. So people who were coming to our meetings were asking for their emotional and mental labor to tell us their stories and tell us how we could do our work better. Um, compensating those folks, we realized was a really important part of launching this work. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Augusto, and I go by the pronouns he, his, and el. I'm a brown-skinned male with very short black hair and black glasses. Today, I'm wearing a blue blazer with a black sweater and a white patterned shirt. So really continuing our work in 2014, we utilized the Federal No Wrong Door Systems Change Grant with the goal of improving district residents experiencing when experience with accessing long-term services and supports. Through this grant, we were able to expand person-centered thinking beyond the Department of Disability Services and create a cultural and linguistic competence subcommittee that worked on building CLC capacity throughout the six district partner agencies. Through this work, we learned that you cannot be person-centered without first understanding the cultural and linguistic context of the person. One of our strategies to build capacity in this area was to braid CLC into various strategic initiatives, such as our partnership and employment grant, which strongly focused on family engagement, person-centered discovery, and embedded CLC in various activities. Then in 2017, we continue our journey with the Cultural and Linguistic Competence Community of Practice. So we formed that group um, with a lot of the same people we've been working with and focused on building trust within our community of practice with our group and then also with DC's diverse cultural and linguistic communities. We started focusing most intentionally on engaging with the Latinx community in DC because we already had some connections in that community and we wanted to build on that. We always kind of say, you know, start where you are. And that was a place where we felt like we could make an impact um, more immediately. So now we uh, are five years later, we have an annual conference all in Spanish that provides information and resources to DC's Latinx community. And our theme in 2022 was all about employment. So we had our whole conference all in Spanish, all about employment. And we are now leading the bridging, the bridging aging and disability networks and racial equity community of practice and are continuing to push forward systems change using cultural and linguistic competence and racial equity as a guide. So that's a little bit of our story and how we got to where we're at currently. Wow. Those were some amazing employment outcomes that you shared with us. We all know that outcomes are great, but the part that's crucial is getting individuals to participate and at times can and at times that can be challenging. Um, Mark and Allison, can you tell us uh, about how you have worked together to improve outreach and engagement of people with disabilities and families from underserved communities? and also sharing, um, where did you start? And next slide, please. So I'll start. So first and foremost, I am super grateful for our partnership with Allison and the Developmental Disability Council. The Department on Disability Services and the DD Council have a long-standing positive working relationship, and we maintain a steadfast commitment to cultural and linguistic competence and racial equity in all of our work together. We share contacts and work to build relationships as a team. For activities and events we plan together, we collaborate and share resources to ensure language interpretation is provided. Disability accommodations are readily available. Stipends are available for community members who need them. And when possible, we provide paid work-based learning opportunities for youth with disabilities. Yeah, and um, I, I agree, Mark and I, I I think it, it's worth saying that some of this work happens 
so um, seamlessly and successfully because Mark and I have developed such a positive relationship working together. Um, so I, I think that, that that can't be understated. Sometimes just finding um, the people you click with um, to to be those thought partners and push the work forward. So um, we've we've focused a lot on building partnerships so that we can expand our our outreach and develop mutually beneficial relationships where we can work with organizations and support them to learn about disability inclusion and access, and then we can also learn from them about cultural norms or unique community strengths and needs. So for example, through our engagement with the Latinx community, we developed Vamos DC, which is a committee of 13 partner agencies focused on engaging Latinx people with disabilities. And we're always incorporating listening sessions into our events um, so that we can share feedback with agency leaders. And I just want to add a little bit about Vamos DC. The 13 agencies represent the lifespan. So we have agencies from early into the intervention to our Department on Aging and Community Living. We have we also have non-disability agencies as part of this committee who is really working to share the word, share the word and really build capacity and engage um, Latinx people with disabilities. Thank you. I heard so many great things there. I heard building partnerships, providing support and resources when needed to the communities um, to make it easier for them to participate. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. So next slide, please. So this question is going to be directed to Mark and Allison, as well as joining um, Azave. What have you done specifically with the Latinx and Ethiopian Eritrean communities? So I'll start. So with the Latinx community, the first step was to gather information. We looked at our data and noticed that Latinx people made up 11% of DC's population, but only 2% of people we were serving. That was a huge disparity. We also noticed a lack of representation of the community at stakeholder meetings and activities. As part of our learning, we held one of our cultural linguistic competency community of practice in a DC neighborhood where many Latinx families and businesses live and spoke with a librarian who grew up in the neighborhood. He helped us, he helped to us identify some barriers to engagement, including service systems not having enough accurate information in Spanish, not having staff who reflect the community, legitimate fear of government, and so forth. These barriers have been confirmed in the various listening sessions we have held since. And because of this, we come back to building partnerships and focusing on, on building trust with our community through partnerships, um, getting leadership buy-in with this work, and developing consistent ongoing programming in Spanish, really showing the community that we're, we're committed to offering this on a regular basis and committed to listening. So um, we worked with other organizations that already had built relationships in the Latinx community and started co-hosting events with them. And this comes back to the idea of, we were also helping them learn about disability access and inclusion, which they found a lot of value in. So building those mutually beneficial relationships. Um, and then we had a lot of ongoing program over the last five years on various topics, all in Spanish, including financial education and literacy, employment has come up again and again, mental health, an interesting intersection there with mental health and employment. We talked about that at our last Latinx conference, um, and then general community resources and services. Um, so our first conference all in Spanish was in 2019 and, and organizational leaders at that time committed to doing it annually. We also looked at internal capacity to serve Spanish speakers. It's one thing to say, oh, we want to serve this community. Are you, do you have the capacity to serve them? And that's a question that we should all be asking our agencies and ourselves. And we realized we needed to hire more Spanish speakers within our agencies. We changed job descriptions and postings to reach more bilingual applicants. We learned from listening to people that being able to speak to someone directly in Spanish was absolutely necessary for building trust. 
We reviewed and modified existing policies related to language access, intake, and engagement using the lens of cultural and linguistic competence. And now we've been so fortunate to meet Azeb last year, who has generously given her time to help us learn about the Ethiopian and Eritrean communities in DC and co-hosted events with us, kind of the similar process that we tried to do with the Latinx community, co-hosting these events so that we can listen and we can learn and we can provide information to the community about supports and services. So this year, uh, the DD Council is supporting some parent cafes that Azabe's organization has been organizing, and we're continuing to work together um, to think about other engagements we can do. And our goal in engaging with any cultural or linguistic community is to listen and learn enough to understand what the community needs and wants, and then fit our priorities and resources into that rather than the other way around. So Azeb, I, I, I think everyone has a ton to learn from you. And so I want to toss it over to you and see what you want to add. You're on mute. Azeb, we can't hear you. Perfect. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> My name is Azay Bataro Aderi. I am a she. Uh, I have a dark skin and I have a curly hair. I'm wearing a golden uh, earlobe right now and I'm wearing a blue sweater. I tend to smile when I talk. Um, I'm from the Ethiopian Air Trans Special Needs Community. I'm the founder and president of the Ethiopian Air Trans Special Needs Community. Uh, mainly what we do is we support uh, people with disability and their families get information uh, and uh, advocate for their needs. That's what we do. So how did we work with Mark and uh, ESMT work with uh, Mark and uh, Alison? Uh, is like we were, if you see a life trajectory, ESMT families and individuals with disabilities were like in the bottom here, we have some, they have some information, including me, uh, but I don't know how to access that information to get to the good life. If we see that the trajectory, we are here and the good life is here. Uh, there's a huge uh, gap in between. So what uh, the DD Council and the DDS did for us uh, is they tried to know our needs and address our needs so that each individual gets to get to their full potential and also the families get supported at the same time. So access to information access to resources, access to goods and services. These are all uh, we learned after we met uh, Alison and Mark. Uh, mainly, I am the one who communicate with them and they wanted to reach out to the community, which is the next question. So you can go ahead and ask the next question and I will answer that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Azeb. You all did so much to develop trust, um, gathering data, brought services and, uh, and events to communities, conducted listening sessions to help with buy-in and sharing information um, in the individual's primary language, and then also revisiting um, internal capacity. Azeb, I'm gonna Azeb, I'm gonna stay with you for this next question. What did that outreach mean to the Ethiopian and Eritrean communities? That outreach really brought uh, light to Ethiopian trans special needs community. They came out, they reached out to us, and that brought us, brought us out to light to the community leaders, to government agencies, service providers. How did they do that? They did a listening session last March, and they invited all uh, our uh, group members and DC uh, providers, uh, government agencies attended the meeting. The meeting was held in our own language, materials prepared in our own language, which is Amharic. Uh, and that means a lot to us. We are heard. We, someone is open to listen to us. It means a lot. 
there was that gap. Oh, did he counsel? Who are they? Those people? How are we going to reach them? Oh, the application process. Oh, it's so hard. Who's going to talk to us from that agency? It was, it was our, our intention was like they would never talk to us. Like, who are we? But not like that. That turned around and they want to listen to us. They want to give us a, uh, uh, good information and resources. Uh, Alison mentioned it earlier. Parent Cafe is one of them. We have about five programs every month for the parents, and Parent Cafe is one of it. And all the programs are run by volunteers and no funding. So for the first time, Alison uh, and Mark talked about it, and they decided uh, for us to ask for funding. And we're in the process, and that's a big light and that can uh, go on, it can continue, we can continue the service uh, if we have the funding. And also the information like yesterday, Mark called and what, what, there's a transportation uh, training and uh, your community might benefit from it, please contact this person. And that was amazing, something that we didn't have before. So that outreach really, when I say brought light to the Ethiopian Eritrean community, it really did. Because now it's waking up the Maryland people, Maryland DDA, and Virginia. So uh, Maryland DDA contacted uh, us uh, because of that. So um, we're serving the DMV area people and having those resources, understanding, learning, and having a direct access to them uh, means a lot to the Ethiopian Eritrean Special Needs Community. And I really would like to thank Alison and Mark going out of their way beyond, uh, above and beyond. Uh, so we're grateful for that. We are grateful for Azib, and one, I just wanted to share that one of our core values when hosting presentations is that we will only conduct these um, programming in the native language of the community. That is, we've received many requests from people to say, oh, I would love to present, but I, I don't speak Spanish or I don't speak Amharic. And unfortunately, we decline because we it, it's one of our core values that people should get information in their native language. And then additionally, what, what this has helped is that we also provide ASL interpretation and, and interpretation into English. So our English speakers, for the first time, have to sort of understand what it feels like to get information secondhand and with a delay. And you don't understand how people have really come to understand the nature of interpretation and how sometimes it is not the best thing to use. So I, I, we stress this as our, one of our core values. Thank you, Azeb and Mark. Um, you know, the listening sessions, that's really important. It's really exciting to know that other states are now receptive and are thinking to, you know, do the same. So really exciting. Thank you for sharing. Madeline, I'm going to turn this over to you. The next question, which is what role did the UDC's Division of Workforce Development and Lifelong Learning play in those events? And how does that connect people to Career Pathways partners? Hello, I'm Madeline Levy-Cruz. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and ella. I am a Latinx woman with light melanin, short, close, cropped brown hair, tortoise shell glasses, silver dangling earrings, and a black and white checkered sweater. I tend to talk with my hands. Um, so if you see them flying around, <laughs> that's me. Um, so I'm the Associate Dean for Workforce Development and Lifelong Learning. And um, we are actually the workforce um, we're part of the Workforce Council for all of DC. Um, we kind of have the, the privilege of being both part of the university and part of the DC uh, Workforce Investment Council. And so that gives us a really unique opportunity to work with partners like Mark um, and, 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 and with all the other partners that, that are here today and, and, and really show the community what is available to them through workforce investment. So um, I, my participation in this was, I was one of the Spanish language uh, panelists on one of the, the panels um, that was held and it was fantastic to be able to, to share with the community um, 
all the different uh, resources that we have available for them at UDC, but also all the career pathways that we actually do certification training for um, within the Workforce Development um, Center here at UDC. So um, it was a great partnership and, um, and I think it's, it's gonna lead to a lot of other things. And it's also opened um, my uh, perception as to what else we need to do here um, to, to improve accessibility and also to, to open it up to, to, to all the different um, uh, uh, sectors in, in, in DC. So um, I think that answers that first part. And I know the next one asks a little bit about our pathways, um, but um, I don't know if you wanna move on to that one. Um, so yeah, um, so uh, we actually, as the Workforce Development uh, Center for DC here, we have five pathways um, that offer no cost training, uh, certification training for folks looking to upskill who are under or unemployed in the district. So any district resident um, is able to apply to our center and, and actually take certification courses in um, information technology, in healthcare, including direct care and administrative care, um, in early childhood education, um, uh, in hospitality, and we have general education courses as well. And I wanna say that one of the things that we're working towards, um, particularly after kind of listening to, 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 to the community and what's out there, is bringing some of our programs um, into, into the Spanish language to, so that we can reach um, more folks in, in the district and uh, allow them to understand that this is available for them as well. Um, the other thing that, that that's really fantastic about being a uh, part of the, the University of the District of Columbia is that all the resources that the university has are also available to our students, even though we're a workforce program. So we have the uh, university's Accessibility Resource Center that provides um, a myriad of accessibility uh, accommodations and, 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 and resources for all the students at the university. And and is open as well to any person who wants to um, do certification training at our Workforce Development Center. I hope that answers the question. It sure does. And <laughs> thank you so much, Madeline, for sharing that there's no cost training for certification courses in several fields for DC residents. Like, that's amazing. Um, next slide. Is, and the next question is going to be for Mark. Can you share any initiatives that promote intake staff for different agencies working together? Sure. So as part of the No Wrong Door initiative, hold on, let me put my video on. Sorry, everyone. As part of the No Wrong Door initiative, in our attempt to improve district's residents' experience when accessing long-term service and supports, a front door manager's work group was created with the purpose of increasing collaboration among the front door of the six partner health and human service agencies. During these meetings, participants learn more about the services and supports of their sister agencies, develop models for warm referrals, and learned about additional resources to support district residents. Currently, our one-stop operator works with our WIOA partners to ensure enhanced collaboration, increased knowledge of resources, and effective coordination of referrals. And I can answer the second part. Has it led to a joint intake approaches? Yes. So currently our, st our state workforce agency has developed an electronic system that allows residents to access the various WIOA partners uh, partner services that are being conducted at our American Job Centers. The system allows residents to schedule intakes as well as career services. And I think Madeline could speak to our data vault system as well. Absolutely. And I don't know, I have my camera on, but I can't see myself, so I don't know if it's working. But um, absolutely, uh, through the Data Vault system, all the partners of um, the AJC partners are able to refer to one of another and also to, um, to kind of move, see what the services are that are available at every other partner location. So I know for, my, for, for myself, um, we've been getting referrals from, from some of our our um, 
internal partners that we've had for many years that are now also on, on Databot. But we're also using uh, Databot to refer our students out for some of the services that um, we don't have resources for. So for example, housing, you know, if there's um, any kind of um, issue with one of our students where they need uh, information on that, we can put them into Data Vault, they can refer to the housing authority, and they may be able to assist them with that. And that's that's huge. Um, one of the biggest uh, barriers to continuing your education or to getting certified is being able to meet those basic needs, right? So um, most of our students report that they have issues with housing, with transportation, with childcare, with food insecurity, and having something like like um, Data Vault through the AJC and through the Workforce Investment Council, um, take all of our partners um, and put them in one place, really provides that wraparound service for, for our students and our clients. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to all of our panelists for your amazing work in the community and focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. We have Q&A, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Laura. Thank you to my colleague, Shahida, and our wonderful guest presenters from the District of Columbia, Mark, Allison, Azade, and Madeline, for sharing and allowing us to learn how you have thoughtfully, truly thoughtfully, broadened your understanding and capacity to reach into underserved communities to create inclusive career pathways and how that is leading to systems change. I want to quote something that <clears throat> Allison said early on, uh, something that we all can learn by. She said, we listen and learn enough to understand what the community wants needs and wants, and then based on that, decide how they're going to put in it. Wonderful presentation, a wonderful example. We have uh, great questions that have come from that. So we do have a few minutes for questions. So I think, Allison and Mark, I'm going to start with you and ask you, how have your activities and partnerships built trust with underserved communities so that they are informed about and engaged in employment and career pathway services? Hi, I'm sorry. So our activities have, so trust is ever going, right? So before we get to how these activities have sort of um, impacted. I think one of the things we want to talk about is some of our learning lessons as it relates to building trust. And I think that's where we start. So some of the things that we've learned is that trust takes time. Relationships are essential. Understanding your community's needs and strengths is paramount. Self-assessing your policies, procedures, internal capacities, and data is something that needs to happen on an ongoing basis. Taking time to listen, listen, and listen some more. I think th to us, those are some of our learning lessons. We've we've been able to 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 have to get from this opportunity and really building trust. Allison, you want to talk a little bit about how that shaped our our activities have shaped that? Yeah, I think that that starting with um, I think the most important point here is that it takes time and it. And it takes consistency and and the community needs to see that consistency and see that you're actually committed um, in order to maintain the trust. Um, I think some of it is also related to um, how we structure our staff. So we mentioned both the Department on Disability Services Services and the DC Developmental Disabilities Council, we have increased our, our number of Spanish speaking staff. Um, and for the DD Council, we now have Spanish speakers that serve on the council for people who, um, some of you might know how councils are structured. It's a body that's appointed by um, the governor in a lot of states in DC, appointed by the mayor. Um, and the council members provide the strategic direction um, for the work. And we now have Spanish speaking council members um, who are at the decision making table. So it's building the trust was kind of the first part. And then 
engaging more with people um, uh, once that trust is built helps helps them be at the decision making table and influencing how the work is actually happening so that you can maintain that trust. Um, I think a lot of this, when I think about outcomes led to our employment first summit, that was, it was the first summit of its kind that we did back in October. And um, it was, we, the, it was a big event in English, Spanish, Amharic, uh, and American Sign Language. So we we tried to make sure we had information for our whole community in multiple languages, and were able to connect with a lot of folks with disabilities and their families to talk about employment and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and that family engagement piece, I think, is another really important lesson that we've learned through building trust with some of these communities and, and seeing how a family structure, um, like thinking about services and supports in terms of families, um, not just one person receiving a service is a really important um, approach. And I just want to add that, you know, because of our efforts, we we have some real outcomes. And I want to share some of those. Like in the last four years, our vocational rehabilitation program has increased its percentage of Latinx persons served from 2% what it was when we started to current day 5%. So we've increased the number of Latinx people in our vocational rehabilitation program. Our also, our Latinx Conference on Disabilities is annual. We are preparing our fifth annual conference this year. And we have multiple sponsoring agencies that now plan for the program every year. We connect with about 150 members of the community every year during this conference. And through that, through these listening sessions, we've been we've been able to develop additional programming. One was our Direct Service Professional Academy, which is which is uh, which is a certification program that trains people with disabilities into becoming DSP um, DSPs. Because of the feedback we got at at one of our conferences, we were able to um, host the first bilingual Spanish DSP Academy with the goal of increasing the number of Spanish-speaking DSPs in the community, because the community said they would like people, they would like to be able to communicate with the people who come into their homes. So these are, based off the activities we've done, these are some of the ways that we built trust with the community. We continue to build trust because we list, we try to listen to what they're saying, and we try to always be as truthful and consistent as possible with them so we don't break that trust because it's easy to make trust it's too easy to, to start trust but it's very easy to it's, it's very i'm sorry it's very hard to sort of build the trust but it's easy to break great thank you both mark and allison we have about a minute left but i think this was great what mark and allison said and as they um gonna ask you like in a minute or less what contributed to trust for you? I think it's great hearing it from the side of the agencies that reached out, but what did build the trust for you in this whole process? And it's... And it's Zaid, I'm not sure if you are able to answer. I'm going to actually um, move forward uh, just before we close out. But I, I think that what Mark and Allison and what all of you shared, we could create a checklist here for everything uh, that you put together. So if we can go to the next slide. We have some wonderful resources that sh were shared by both our presenters, uh, Azade, so you can learn more about the Ethiopian community and more about the workforce and learning environment that was shared by Madeline. We also have lead center resources, which will include a link to the roadmap for inclusive career pathways. So if we could go by those. And if we can go to the Lead Center website. 
So be sure to check out the LEAD Center's website where you can find this event's recording and transcript at the end of next week, plus a very robust library of resources. Uh, we also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter as it will give you more information about future and past events and promising practices from the field. And I should say, and I'm sorry I forgot, under the list of lead resources, we just published a new resource, a new, new newsletter, which is devoted to inclusive career pathways. So learn more about the roadmap, learn about some activities that are taking place in New York, and learn about a success story. The next slide, please. And then other ways that you can follow the LEAD Center on social media. We have our social media handles here. If you see a tweet you like, please retweet. Please share posts with your networks and encourage them to follow the LEAD Center. Final slide. And thank you to all of you who joins this presentation today. We hope that the resources, strategies, and experiences shared today will provide you with practical ways to create inclusive career pathways and broaden your reach to underserved communities with us. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.